Uh, it's, uh, anyway, spring is coming, and that means that we're getting close to the end of our committee time. Um, and so today we're gonna talk uh, about substance abuse again and uh, what difference we can make. We're gonna talk about transportation. We're gonna talk about uh, probably one of the most popular bills in the committee this year. It's been up three different times now, Senator Hoffman. And, Thank you, Mr. And Chair. And Ms. Uh, it's just that good of a bill. Um, looking forward, just for the people that are keeping track, uh, we expect we'll be marking up whatever omnibus bill we come up with, which will hopefully have a workforce emphasis on Tuesday, April 4th. Is that the right date? That Tuesday, anyway. Fifth? The fifth. And um, we're deciding about, we're going to have a policy omnibus as well. We've actually reached an agreement with the House on two things, two bills. Uh, one policy, at least non-fiscal, with no fiscal impact bill, and then the omnibus bill. Congrats. And depending upon deadlines, uh, it may be as soon as next Thursday. Uh, and so we're still sorting that out. Uh, and just to give people a heads up, we may go into the evenings that Thursday night and the other Tuesday night, because I think we're going to do the whole bill in one day with going through it, because they just have to get them written, you know. So to go through it and then to um, have testimony and then mark it up however we mark it up here. Um, with that, um, Senator Hoffman. Mr. Chair and members, and congratulations on coming to uh, uh, an, an early um, presumptive uh, gathering of, of the other body, Mr. Chair, on, on some agreements. That's uh, it's good to know, even though our, our, our first deadline isn't here. And <clears throat> You put, you put that picture up and it reminds us why we're in this committee, right, Mr. Chair? Exactly. I, I appreciate that. And, and I, I want to segue to uh, a disturbing email, Mr. Chair, if you allow me a moment to uh, raise a point of question to you, if you're Absolutely. okay with that. <clears throat> so uh, got an email uh, yesterday, uh, Mr. Chair, and this is in wake of, uh, you know, what's happening within the uh, group home closings. And I, I'm, for the sake of their own personal identity, I, I'm not going to say their names, uh, Mr. Chair, but I'm going to tell you that the, the, the email started with my family. My family is having an emergency and we desperately need your help. Um, a woman sent a, an email that said her and her husband, they're 73 years old and their daughter has been living in an ACR group home, Mr. Chair, for 20 years and it's closing March 17th. Uh, after scrambling to find a new home and provider, She's been accepted to live in an ICF. Mr. Chair, you go from a waiver to an ICF, intermediate care facility, and, um, which is an institution, but it requires that she give up her waiver. It's a huge loss, Mr. Chair, and, and guaranteed that there's no guarantee she'll get it back. But moving her into an institution, the, the mom writes, is, is far, from ideal, far, far from ideal, but we have no other choice. And, and here's the, the, the piece here. The ICF won't be ready for this young woman to move into till March 30th. And so there's a 13-day gap <clears throat> that this woman and her husband have no choice but to bring their daughter home, which creates an enormous hardship. Did I tell you that the parents are 73 years old? Um, their daughter requires wheelchair to get around and 15 to 20 Hoyer lifts a day. And their house is not barrier-free or accessible and that she requires middle of the night care um, and has hard to use equipment. They're worried that they won't be able to provide the care that their daughter needs alone. And the organization that has been their daughter's home for 20 years would not offer to care for their daughter during that 13 day interim period until the ICF, the institution takes over. It's just her and her husband. Um, they said, then, please, we've tried everything. We filed an appeal and extension of the ACR's determination notice, but lost. Uh, they worked with the ombudsman's office, who provided good information, but unable to help the situation, Mr. Chair. They've even sent emails to the governor's office and did not receive a response. And they've listed, they've gone to everybody they can think of, but to no avail. And it feels, and this is what I think prompted why I want to read you this, it feels like our disability system in Minnesota is broken. Uh, we feel that their daughter has no rights. And then the mom uh, went on to say they're desperate. Please respond. We welcome an opportunity to problem solve with you, joint problem solving. 
if only we had somebody that could help us in our home for a minimum amount of hours per day or at least somebody who could do the one hour required for overnight care so that they could get a night's sleep. Um, or perhaps an umbrella agency could please reach out to the founder of that organization and maybe bridge that short timeline. Um, and then she said, thank you for considering us. So Mr. Chair, I had some other points, but I just wanted to highlight that to you. And it's just sad that waiver systems were set up to waive your rights to be institutionalized. And now we're going backwards. Yeah, it's, uh, it's tragic. And you know, this committee has been talking about this since September about what's going to happen. We were concerned it was going to happen, and now here's an example. This is in your packets, members, and it's also online. I got an email uh, Friday. Uh, it came actually Monday. I didn't see it until Friday. I'm sorry I'm behind, but like, holy buckets. Um, and so um, I, too, sent it off to the commissioner so that they could know. Um, and uh, so we put some time aside at the end of the meeting to talk about this. Um, it's, it's not a crisis till it affects someone you love. And I don't know this person, but I think we all love her. Yeah. And uh, we're, we'll see where it goes. So <laughs> it's not a drill, no. Senator Hoffman. It's not a drill committee. It's not a drill public. It's not a drill this wonderful family. So, um, so let's just put that aside for the moment, if we can, and then uh, let's, uh, Senator Hoffman, do you have another 3165 to be before us? And yeah, Mr. Chair, too. I do. There's two. There's a couple amendments, and um, Ms. Grom is on there, and I just want to say thank you for being open to the discussion earlier. But yeah, to the, this is that wonderful bill, Senate File 3165, that um, we've had three or four times in front of you. Yeah. So thank you very much for finding yeah. time. Ms. Grom is all ready to, uh, yeah. the, the first amendment, we, if we could move let's that. Let's move the amendments and get it in order, assuming yep. that those are both from the department. No, uh, no, Mr. Chair, the one is from the department. The other one was worked on by um, staff and um, Mr. Monahan and the uh, uh, folks from the county system. So Okay, just let's do the, the department one. Which one is that? That would be the A2, I believe. Okay, Ms. so let's Grom. work on that. That'll give the department the chance to describe their bill. Everybody understand? Senator Hoffman moves to A2. Uh, everybody understand that? Any questions? All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? <coughs> Ms. Grom, welcome to the committee. You never thought this day would come, did you? It is a spring day, and so here you are. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, for the record, Christy Brown with the Department of Human Services. Um, and I knew this day would come, but I'm so excited to be here. So um, super grateful to, to get some of your committee time. I do have a um, PowerPoint, brief PowerPoint that I can share if that works for you, Mr. Chair. That sounds perfect. Just don't ask me to share it. Mr. Chair. All right. Senator, just a second, Senator Hoffman. Well, uh, thank you. Uh, Ms. Grom, do uh, you want to explain that bridge in your picture? <laughs> Ms. Oh, Grom. Um, Senator Hoffman, uh, Mr. Chair, I believe it's a bridge in Anoka. <laughs> I thought it was pretty. Uh, so I, I Ms. Grom, it actually, it bridges you. Anoka to Champlin. It, it, just, it's it's the Champlin bridge. For. You Mr. wanted to Chair. hear Champlin. So, <laughs> hey, Ms. Grom, thank you for enlightening hey. me. That's a pretty picture. <laughs> All right, um, so I can go ahead and describe the bill um, via the, the PowerPoint um, that members should be seeing right now, unless Senator Hoffman, you wanted to provide any remarks um, up to you. Mr. Chair, uh, Ms. Crown, go ahead. I, I have that, but go ahead. You've got the slide up. Go ahead and go through the bill, and we can talk afterwards. Okay. All right. Um, so thank you again, Senator Hoffman, for authoring our bill and uh, Mr. Chair and members for some time today to describe the bill and hear about it. Um, members should have in, your, in their packets a handout um, that'll use as kind of a guide to walk through the components of the bill. And there are um, six main topic areas um, in the bill. So there's some technical correction, there's um, telehealth cleanup, there's mental health uniform service standards, um, something called culture of safety codification. Um, early intensive developmental behavioral intervention changes, and then ABLE account federal conformity. 
So I will first start with some of the more um, technical and cleanup items and try to breeze through those very quickly. Um, and I'll be noting where they are um, in this section in the bill. So hopefully members can take a look and, and see what I'm talking about as I'm describing the provisions. Um, so the first um, kind of bucket of technical corrections includes in section nine, um, a repeal of a outdated foster care moratorium exception. This is an exception that expired in 2018. Um, it's no longer needed um, or valid, so we're just cleaning up the books and removing that. Um, and then moving to section 10, there's a clarification related to integrated community supports um, that providers need to report the number of people receiving ICS services in the settings capacity report. This is a requirement that exists in our waiver plans and is, um, I believe, current guidance. So we're just um, conforming to current practice to, um, to make sure that the settings capacity report actually makes sense and what we're um, what it needs to be doing in terms of compliance with the HCDS rule. Um, we, in sections 26 to 27, we're correcting some eligibility for long-term homeless supported services grants um, to ensure that tribal nations are consistently included across statute. So this is a grant that both tribes and counties um, are eligible to receive, but um, we notice that we don't always consistently note that tribes are eligible in the statute. So we're just making that consistent across, um, across the law. Section 31 is a reviser instruction. It updates chemical dependency to substance use disorder. This is just um, modernizing our language and aligning it with um, all of the scientific literature out there in the DSM. Um, section 32 is a repealer, um, and this repeals the Citizens Advisory Council, which is no longer in existence. Um, so just cleaning up the books on that one as well. And then section 32, another repealer, we've got the repealing the substance use disorder continuum of care pilot project. Um, this is not a pilot project that's an operation. It was um, established in 2013 as a way for providers to implement SUD direct access um, prior to full statewide implementation, um, which is going to be occurring this July. So we're really excited about that. And I, um, I know you've heard about that as part of the governor's budget as well. Um, and then moving on to some of the telehealth um, kind of technical and, and cleanup changes. So in section 21, um, we are simplifying and clarifying some language around long-term care consultation, remote reassessment. Um, so last session, uh, the legislature made some changes to allow for remote reassessment. Um, and we did it kind of at the end of session. And as we were reviewing it after session, um, working with our county um, partners, we just noticed that there could be some additional clarity added the last session, um, the requirement for people on disability waivers was that if they were going to get a remote reassessment, they and the legal representative and the lead agency case manager all had to agree that there was no change in condition, um, that there wasn't a need for a change in service and that a remote reassessment was appropriate. Um, and so just had a few kind of issues with that because the assessment essentially is what determines when someone has a um, change in condition. Um, and then there could be situations where a person um, has changes in their condition, but still might prefer a remote reassessment in the case manager and others might agree. So we worked with counties to clean this language up and just clarifying um, that as long as the person and their legal representative um, provide informed consent to receive the assessment um, remotely, then that would be appropriate. And then on telehealth uh, sections 18 and 30, these are just aligning with um, legislative intent. We had heard some feedback from stakeholders that they really wanted to make it clear um, that they have the authority to continue um, audio only modalities for the purposes of um, certain services. So section 18 is clarifying that um, in order to meet the face-to-face -face requirements um, and get the encounter rate for FQACs and other settings like certified community behavioral health clinics, um, that um, audio only modalities can be used for a certain period of time. And then similarly, we're making a change in section 30 related to targeted case management, um, making, that, making that same clarification that face-to-face -face requirements um, can um, be sufficient to, to get the rate. Um, and these were changes that happened at the legislature. We've talked to chairs about them. It's just uh, clarification. And then lastly, on the technical and kind of cleanup part of our bill, uh, mental health uniform services standards. Um, these uh, are the bulk of the bill, sections one through eight, 11 through 15, 17, 20, 22 to 23 and 28. Um, so this is primarily updating cross references for the most part. Um, we're also making some changes, reconciling the language that was passed in the first regular session on uniform service standards with um, some of the changes that were made in similar statutes. 
um, in special sessions. So we just had to make some, some updates to language to make sure it all worked together. Um, and then there were just a few things that we left out of, of USS. It was a huge bill last session and we were inevitably um, didn't get it perfect. And so we're just um, making a few cleanups. These, these are all um, non-controversial items that we've discussed with stakeholders. And then moving to the, um, the Home and Community-Based Services Culture of Safety Program. So this is a provision of the bill that establishes authorizing language for our HCBS Culture of Safety Program, which um, in a nutshell is a type of critical incident review that um, um, essentially this language is making clear that the roles and responsibilities of the critical incident review team um, are you know, explicated in law and we're allowing for some data privacy protections as well as protections for people um, participating in the reviews to help encourage participation so that we can learn more about what the critical incidents were and how we can improve as a system. Um, just for some background on this particular topic, um, the culture of safety program uses or analyzes critical incidents using a, um, what's called the safety science lens to um, really enhance accountability and improve safety. Um, moving beyond um, sort of that blame-based approach, which we use in other parts of the system and is, um, has value as well, but we're trying to move um, toward a more holistic, improvement-focused approach that really identifies how the system as a whole might have contributed to a critical incident. So as folks know, the typical model for conducting investigations is really focusing on you know, the maltreatment that occurred, who was responsible, who was at fault, and it's, it's really more of a punitive approach. Um, which in some cases makes sense, and we will continue to have those options for critical incidents through our um, maltreatment investigations and licensing actions. But in some cases, that's not necessary, um, or um, another approach might really complement those other approaches. So um, this is just codifying that the language of um, what we're currently doing in our HCBS uh, culture of safety pilot. Um, we started this pilot in 2018. We have a steering committee um, that includes a variety of providers and a bunch of um, lead agency staff, as well as, of course, DHS representation. Um, and they have endorsed these changes and asked us to move this language forward this session. And moving to uh, early intensive developmental behavioral intervention. Um, most of this language is cleanup language, so I won't dwell on it too much. Um, we're kind of defining and further clarifying some of the modifications that were made in previous sessions by providers. Um, so um, just clarifying some definitions um, around terminology changes that were made in previous sessions. We have worked with the provider community to make sure that um, everyone's agreeable to this new language. Um, and I don't know, Senator Hoffman might be raising his hand at someone, um, maybe not me. To the I good, to the good Senator Christie from Rochester, I saw her, her light pen come up and I was just pointing, that's all, that's funny. Oh. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Nelson. Mr. Chair, oh. yeah. Th thank you so much. I am just wondering, um, uh, Christy, uh, you know, I'd like to read the language in the bill as you're, um, you know, identifying it. If you have uh, it available, it'd be really helpful if you told us about what page you're on or about what line you're on so we can actually see the language. Thank you so much. Ms. Grom. Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Nelson, I apologize. So the culture of safety um, proposal is in section 18 of the bill. I'm sorry, section 16 of the bill, I believe. Um, and and counselor, someone can correct me if I'm wrong. I don't have the bill right in front of me. Okay, keep going, thanks. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and then as I was mentioning, early intensive developmental behavioral intervention um, this is in sections 24 and 25, mostly just updating some definitions and making some clarifications um, related to telehealth changes, but also um, one of the substantive changes in this area is related to qualified supervising professionals um, and making their attendance at coordinated care conferences um, optional. Um, so I think most of us know here, but just in case you don't, EIDBI is our medical assistance autism benefit for children and youth. Um, and this particular provision, um, is related to, to coordinated care conferences, which are voluntary meetings that the person and their family have to review their individual treatment plan and really to update their progress and make changes as needed. And what we found um, as a result of the workforce shortage is that um, qualified supervising professionals are hard to find and hard to get time with. And as a result, some families have had to wait um, to get these to, to do the care coordination conferences. And so we want to make sure that when it's appropriate that those care coordination conferences can happen 
without the QSC or the qualified supervising professional necessarily in that space. They'll continue to have the responsibility to sign off on all the plans and approve everything and make sure that it um, that it makes sense from a clinical perspective and um, that it aligns with you know person-centered planning. And then the last section, um, I believe, uh, is sorry, trying to operate my screen at the same time, related to our, um, our ABLE account, our federal conformity proposal, I believe this is section 26. Um, so achieving a better life experience is what ABLE stands for. Um, and this is a proposal that just aligns Minnesota state law with the Internal Revenue Service final rules. Um, on that particular program, this is a tax advantage savings account that allows people with disabilities um, to build their savings without risk losing their benefit. Um, uh, benefits like MA and, and disability waiver programs. So it's a really important program to help people be able to save and stay out of poverty or move out of poverty. Um, since the, the passage of the federal law, the IRS has been working on finalizing those uh, final rules and those uh, were finalized last summer. Um, so this change would just allow another person to establish an account on behalf of an eligible individual if the person was unable to do so for themselves. Um, so someone like a, um, a parent or a guardian or a grandparent or a spouse could now establish um, an account for someone. And the reason that we felt it was important to make this change in state law was um, that although we have the IRS rules that state this can occur, we've heard in Minnesota that there's still a lot of confusion and that in some cases people were actually seeking out a conservator um, for, for the sole purpose of setting up an evil account, which is um, you know, a more restrictive um, service that we would want to steer people away from. And um, so making this change in state law, we hope will clarify that it's an option for other people to set up those accounts. And I think that's all I had to share today, but I would Thank be you. happy to answer questions. Yeah, so any questions about the testimony so far? I don't see any. Um, Senator Hoffman, the, the county said an amendment. Yeah, uh, Mr. And, Chair. And they were going to testify. Ms. Dietz? Uh, I think, yeah, you there's online? the... Do you want me to explain the A3 amendment to, to get to Dietz, to get to Ms. Dietz, or do you want no, her to explain just, and then we can talk about well, it? Well, why would she come if she didn't explain the amendment? All right, well, I'll let her explain it then. She only has one job. Well, by the way, Mr. Job. Chair, can I get a little bit of information? 2014, ABLE accounts were passed in the state of Minnesota. I believe then Representative Abler was the chief author in the House. And mm -hmm. I was Senator in Hoffman, the author. That's correct, so... Pretty good. And if I'm wrong, Christy can correct us. So I know that uh, <clears throat> that's good. Ms. Dietz, do you want to welcome to the committee? And Senator Hoffman will move the A3 amendment so you can tell us about it, please. Yes. Welcome. Good morning, Mr. Chair and committee members. My name is Bob Dietz, and I'm the Human Services Director at Brown County. I'm representing the Minnesota Association of County Social Service Administrators today, or MAXA. We are requesting an amendment to Statute 256G.02, Subdivision 6. When Waiver Reimagined Phase 1 went into effect on January 1st, 2021, there were two new services that were added to the menu of waiver services. Um, one of them was called Day Support Services, and it virtually replaced day training and habilitation and structured day program from the waivers and combined it into the Day Support Services. Um, and these previous services were always excluded time, or are excluded time services in the statute. Integrated Community Supports is a new residential support service that is offered in provider controlled housing. So both of these services either replace or are similar to what are currently excluded time services in 256G. So Max is requesting that they be added to the statute to provide clarity to counties that these are excluded time services. We're not changing anything in the statute. These are just newly new services or newly named services. This should prevent unnecessary time being spent on disputes about who is responsible for payment of these services. The plan is for waiver reimagined to move to two different types of waivers and individualized budgets versus county budgets in the future. However, this still may be quite a few years down the road. In the meantime, counties are requesting the statute be updated to reflect these renamed or comparable waiver services. Thank you, Senator Huffman, for authoring this bill, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. And Ms. Grom, do you have an opinion about this amendment on behalf of the department? Um, Mr. Chair, Christy Grom with the department, we are, um, I would say, we're, we're neutral on this issue. I think we understand this to be sort of a, a historical um, county versus county issue when it comes to waiver services. Ultimately, 
we um, don't really think we need to utilize this kind of model at all. Um, we really want to make sure that people have case managers where they live and case managers who understand the services available in their community. Um, once waiver reimagine happens, it won't be an issue because individualized budgets um, will be happening for people. So um, we don't have any opposition per se, um, but okay. that's our opinion that this isn't necessary. Well, thank you, and uh, just my inclination is if we adopt it, then it can get sorted through the process. It's my intention, and, and just to the whole bill, um, there's no big long line of anybody wanting to testify either way about it, and frankly, if you like it, I'm happy to know that, but if you have any concerns about any element of it, please contact Senator Hoffman or myself. Uh, it's, we want to only do helpful things, and some things are not as technical as we think, so don't be shy to feedback to us. Any questions about the A2, A3 amendment? Senator Hoffman? Uh, Mr. Chair, I All just, right. the, Ms. Dietz did a great job explaining everything yeah. here, so let's pass All right, it. Well, let's adopt it for now, and then this will be sorted through the process. All in favor of that, say aye. 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 Opposed? <coughs> it's adopted. Uh, Senator Hoffman, uh, any questions about the bill as amended? Don't see a lot of hands. Uh, Senator Hoffman, you want the last word? Mr. Chair, thank you, and thank you, Ms. Grom. Uh, uh, Commissioner, you got a you got a great team uh, in Matt Burdick and Christy Grom out there that are able to come forward and explain things that make sense and, and do it in a, a meaningful way and uh, appreciate the work that Christy Grom does uh, with this committee and, and with me on this bill. And so with that, Mr. Chair, I want to um, uh, move the uh, Senate file 3165 to the discretion of where the chair wants it to go. It's going to be laid over on the table. So with that, uh, we'll move on. Uh, next bill up is uh, Senator Hoffman bill. Um, has to do with any non-emergency non medical transportation and uh, as the topic that we'll be discussing at the end, it came up as an emergency. Uh, yeah, see if you want to come down. Um, and so without uh, delay, uh, we found some time on our calendar to talk about this. I think if we can invest about 20 minutes on this topic today, that'll be a good start. Yep. Uh, it won't be the last, but uh, so, and there's four testifiers, so if you can go you know, a couple minutes each, and if somebody says something, you don't have to repeat that something. Think of a new something. So, Senator Hoffman, to the bill. Mr. Chair, to the bill, and, and it becomes a, an urgent situation as we see gas prices rise in, in, the, uh, in the state of Minnesota due to some unforeseen circumstance. I'm not going to get into the, to the weeds on that, but here's the kicker, Mr. Chair and members. When the dollar amount gets to $4.50 per gallon, your non-emergency medical transportation providers will cease to exist in the state of Minnesota because they are no longer fiscally um, solvent at that point or fiscally available. So with that, this is what brings this in front of you, Mr. Chair. And I have Scott Isaacson, who I believe is online, Tarek Menesi, who is with Driving Ms. Daisy, and Jeremy Kramer from Blue and White. And I think um, Director Dietz is also available for comment on right. this as well. So with that, Mr. Chair. Senator um, Hoffman, did you want to move the A1? Just uh, That's a... Well, let's just get the bill amended. Was that your amendment, Senator Hoffman? Uh, Mr. The, Chair. Yes, the, uh, the mileage adjuster thing. I think that came from your office, but if there's, I did not have a notation of the A1, but in this case, let's move the A1 amendment. Yeah, and this is a gas price escalator. And um, I do not know what our ability would be to help here, but we certainly want to be part of the discussion. And I want every tool that's available for us to talk about. So I guess that was my amendment, so. Um, so, anybody, all, anybody understand the amendment? Um, <laughs> never mind. Whose amendment was that, Mr. Chair? Uh, thanks for helping with my amendment. <laughs> Thank so. you. <laughs> all in favor of the A1 say aye. 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 Opposed? <laughs> all right, that's the adopted. So, Mr. Isaacson, I guess you're first, so welcome to the committee. He's online. Thank you. Can you hear me? Oh, you're on. Sorry, you popped up. I'm I thought you were one of the two folks. Here? Yeah, welcome. Yeah, we can hear you good. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and committee members. My name is Scott Isaacs, and I'm here today representing Lyft Transportation, which has been serving rural communities in East Central and Northern Minnesota for 23 years, as well as the R80 Non-Emergency Medical Transportation Association, which is a group of veteran providers from outstate Minnesota. Our organization strongly encourages your support of uh, Senate File 2999, which provides for increased rates for NEMT providers. Uh, since I became a part of this organization 13 years ago, there's only been one permanent increase in rates, which uh, was over a decade ago. Since that time, of course, all the costs associated with operating our company have risen dramatically. Insurance costs have actually doubled. Maintenance costs have gone up over 
acquisition costs for vehicles went up 32% just this past year alone, according to Mannheim Consulting. Um, in addition, labor costs have risen sharply and the cost to retain our current employees has followed that same trend. Fuel costs are obviously a tremendous concern right now. Um, even if they return to pre-war prices, we're, we're still going to be struggling. Uh, historically, our industry has been unable to provide benefits for our employees due to low reimbursement rates and margins. And now that's costing us in the form of attrition and the inability to recruit and hire qualified drivers. Uh, we're struggling just to keep our teams put together. And for all intents and purposes, uh, if this continues, it's going to be impossible for us to recruit any new drivers. And these rising costs are just making it unsustainable to do business without uh, a raise in reimbursement rates. The combination of the stagnant reimbursement rates and the dramatically rising costs are creating a perfect storm for our industry. Last year, Minnesota saw a historic number of NEMT companies permanently close their doors. Our company just completed our financials for 2021. And frankly, without the help of uh, temporary enhanced rates from MCOs, and the PPP loan program, we would have also been a casualty to this storm. Um, this is occurring amidst an unprecedented need for our services as well. Uh, a recent study uh, done by a, a friend of mine who's a professor at University or Bemidji State University uh, found that lack of transportation was their number one barrier to care for uh, people in their communities who are the most disenfranchised. Uh, this group of people um, does not have the ability to transport themselves to medical appointments and they rely on companies like ours to safely and dependably reach their care that they need. Without reimbursement rate increases to cover our costs, companies like mine are gonna fall to the wayside, leaving those in need which, with a much more difficult time getting to their medical appointments. One of our clients who's an elderly amputee said that without our services and the care of our drivers, she'd have absolutely no way to get to her medical appointments. We all know that care for this group of people is critical Hundreds of thousands of elderly and vulnerable adults and children in Minnesota are in dire need of our services. Uh, this is not a luxury service, but a life-sustaining necessity. Without providing uh, proper funding for this industry, the disenfranchised in Minnesota are gonna experience severe declines in medical care that they need and, and frankly deserve. Telehealth and mobile health can't cover the gap uh, for these people needing in-person visits with their providers such as people going to uh, addiction treatment and dialysis patients. So not only on my behalf and our company and our association, but on behalf of all Minnesotans in desperate need of our services, we really urge support of Senate file 2999 so that uh, people like me can continue to care for those in need within our communities. Thank you senators for authoring this bill and thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you, Mr. Isaacson for your uh, just sadly compelling testimony. Um, Mr. Manisi? Yes. Hello, welcome to the committee. Thank you, thank you Mr. Chair and thank you um, committee for um, giving me a chance to speak today. So my name is Tarek Menisi. Um, I am the Chief Financial Officer for Driving Miss Daisy. Our company is a non-emergency medical transportation provider who's been in business for over 10 years. We drive patients to and from their medical appointments. Most of our patients are physically disabled, wheelchair bound, full number of members, other times they are minors with mental health issues. So right now we are turning down rides in the metro. Um, we have parents of the patients who are calling our office in tears crying asking why we are declining rides. They are expressing concerns of how vital it is for them to get to their appointments on time. A lot of them are in wheelchairs and can't simply order an Uber or they just can't afford an Uber. This is why state-funded medical transportation exists. We've had patients so frustrated that they've asked for our DOT number to file a complaint with the Department of Transportation claiming discrimination because we are declining their state-funded rides. However, we are turning down these rides because it's financially not feasible. DHS and Minnesota legislation has been refusing to increase the provider rates for almost a decade. Now, our focus has been on private pay non-state funded rides because the private pay market is two to three times more than the state rates. In my opinion, I view the private rates as the fair market value. This ends up hurting the minority and underprivileged communities as they cannot pay out of pocket and rely on state funded rates. 
This is unacceptable, in my opinion. By not raising the DHS state-funded rates, it forces us to change our business model to focus more on private pay. Um, this brings me to my second point, which was addressed. Um, hiring and retaining drivers has been an absolute nightmare. Um, since the rates haven't changed, it's been very difficult to retain drivers and hire drivers. So this forces us to lower the quality of required qualifications in applicants just to fill positions. Over time, this is going to have a dangerous impact on non-emergency medical transportation companies as they can only afford inexperienced drivers. There is not a driver shortage issue, but rather an inadequate rate issue. And this brings me to my third and final point, which is just the reality of the inflationary environment that we live in today. In the last 10 years, minimum wage doubled from 7 to 15 per hour. Um, the price of fuel recently doubled from $2 to over $4. Um, our insurance on our company vehicles doubled from 250 to over $500 per month per vehicle. Um, and to add insult to injury, the price of a DHS background check on a new driver doubled from $20 to $42 in the last year alone. That's over a 100% increase in just a year. So to me, DHS is also raising their annual licensing fee that they charge to us because they know they need to increase their revenues to retain their employees. DHS acknowledges inflation when it comes to running their own business. Minnesota has a $9 billion surplus, yet we as a transportation companies have not seen a rate increase in nearly a decade. Does that sound fair to you? Thank you. Thank you very much. That was very well spoken. Um, Mr. Kramer, is it? Yeah, welcome. Hey, thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Blair and the committee members. Thank you, Hoffman, for authoring the bill. You know, what these guys have said already is kind of hits the nail on the Mr. head. Mr. Kramer, get a little closer to oh, the mic sorry. there. No, what, it's good. Yeah. What I don't want to miss a word. Yeah, yeah, sorry. What these guys have said have, have really hit the nail on the head, and it's a lot of what I had in my testimony. You know, we're, we're seeing the same things in, in, in trying to retain drivers. And with everything, with the inflation the way it is, just trying to keep up has been a, a challenge. Even this morning, we had 50 orders that were blinking red, which basically means we were running behind for those people. And a lot of these people are going to dialysis, uh, cancer treatments, um, treatments for their kids. So it's, it's really sad to hear that stuff. So um, the other piece is that um, federal law that pre uh, prevents NEMT drivers to get paid for every mile. Um, and they're the only profession that can be sent on a job and not get paid because the member's not ready, not available, not there. Um, so there's no no-show fee. These drivers actually just lose money. They go out there for no reason and are not reimbursed for that. Um, <clears throat> if you call a plumber or an electrician, you know, they get $90 up front uh, where these guys get nothing. It's just go on to your next order. Um, commercial insurance, as they touched on, uh, since Minnesota is a no fault, uh, we fall under that, and we and so our rates have just gone through the roof for insurance alone, um, and just you know, I, a lot of what I said has already been said, so I don't want to touch on it. But when COVID hit in 2020, our drivers um, volunteered to become frontline workers. Uh, they were transporting patients to isolation centers even during the unknowns of COVID. Um, to protect our drivers, um, we bought masks, gloves, and we made disinfectants uh, right in our office because it was, it was virtually impossible to find. Um, protecting our drivers and riders was our biggest concern. We constructed plastic shields in the cabs made from supplies that we found at Home Depot. Um, they weren't selling those types of items you know, until six months later, so we had to do what we could. Um, our concern for Minnesotans took precedent over all else. And during the protests after the death of Mr. George Floyd, uh, during the unrest, uh, MCOs asked us to help them out and get people to grocery stores outside of that area. Uh, while public transportation was shut down, we, our drivers stepped up and, and, and made, filled that gap for some of these people. Um, and we understood the commitment to the, of the people and our state. And, and we were awarded a Community Hero Award, so it, it was, you know, we did what we could, but now we're asking you guys to help us where, you know, where we fall short with these rates. Thank you, guys. Thank you. That was well said. And Senator Hoffman, does Ms. Brown um, or Ms. Dietz want to say anything? 
Brown County. <laughs> Ms. Dietz, do you want to say anything? And then we'll look kind of start talking. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, again, for the record, my name is Bob Dietz, and I'm the director of Brown County Human Services. Um, I'm testifying today in support of this um, bill on behalf of the Minnesota Association of County Social Service uh, Administrators. I want to thank Senator Huffman for authoring this legislation, and we want to thank you for allowing me to testify today. EDNET is a federally mandated benefit that enables medical assistance members to access covered health care services using the most cost-effective model of transportation for non-emergency medical appointments. The federal government requires states to provide EDNET assistance to the nearest qualified provider using the least expensive type of appropriate transportation. Types and levels of transport are determined by medical necessity. Eligible providers must meet specific criteria as defined by the Minnesota Department of Transportation vehicle and driver requirements. Additional driver and attendant training for protected transportation services and Minnesota Healthcare Program Provider Enrollment or local county or tribal agency criteria. Currently, NMED is administered in a variety of ways across the state, from the medical transportation management or MTM model to individual counties or regions contracting directly with transit providers or volunteers. Beginning in July 2022, all contracted providers will be registered with the state and all trips will have a provider or a driver associated with it, allowing for greater tracking and oversight in the billing process. All EdMed transport services include reimbursement in the rates for all activities of the transport driver needed to ensure the safe loading, unloading, and transport of the ride. It is important that the rates for transportation are sufficient to cover the increased costs of transport and to support a stable workforce. The current workforce shortage and increase in gas prices has created additional challenge for these providers. It is essential that we have stability in this service so people are able to access their healthcare providers. This is currently at risk. In Brown County, we contract with two MCOs, South Country Health Alliance and Blue Plus for individuals who are enrolled in their plan. For individuals who are on fee-for-service medical assistance, the county makes the arrangements for the transportation. All of these individuals who've had to find rides are indicating the difficulty in finding, finding rides because of lack of drivers for those transportation um, operators. Another example I can share from across the state, state is in Scott County. Scott County runs the NMEC program for Scott and Carver. And their transit supervisor reached out recently with concerns relating to the driver shortage. Recently, they had a Scott provider quit unexpectedly. And while others providers stepped up to help, they do not have drivers available in some areas of the county. So trips were being denied and people didn't have a way to get to the health care. Providers are also reporting that drivers are quitting same day with no notice. Carver's, Carver providers are reached out stating that with costs way up, the gas prices as we know are up, and no rate change in several years, that it was becoming very difficult to continue to provide the service. Human service directors from across the state discussed this challenge at a recent meeting. This is a concerning issue across the state. Medicaid reimburses counties one-to-one -one for rates paid out to providers, so we do not expect this bill to create adverse impacts to counties. Thank you, Senator Huffman, for authoring this bill, and I'm happy to answer any questions the community might have. Thank you very much. Senator Hoffman. Mr. Chair and members, a couple of things. And thank you um, to, to have the Association of County uh, Social Workers all or Social Service Administrators, uh, MAXA, whatever, yeah. um, another acronym in our world. Uh, it means a lot, and, and it reminds me of my, uh, my mother-in-law. If it wasn't for an EMT um, who provided transportation uh, to her appointments from beautiful downtown Winstead out to Waconia, Minnesota, um, it was with respect and dignity and care. I mean, it, the, those drivers are doing a service that nobody else is doing in, in the state. And I think it's important. And the other thing with that, Mr. Chair, um, <clears throat> we have to put an assurance in there that these rates that, that you go in and, and as you're traveling this along, make, making sure that the assurance is the rates go to the drivers, because there are some 1099 drivers in this piece. So you want to make note, Mr. Chair, of how that assurance language would be in there that the rates go to the make sure they get to the drivers directly all right um, comments from members Senator uh, I'll Senator Fonte then Senator Nelson uh, yeah 
Thank you. Can you hear me, Mr. Chair? Uh, perfect, yeah. Awesome, awesome. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Um, and I appreciate everyone coming out and testifying today. Um, NEMT services help folks um, make it to and from medical appointments. And uh, we just heard that access to these services are critical to making sure that people are receiving care. And uh, it is important that these services are dependable or so that um, folks that have no, literally no other option can make it to these appointments. Uh, we heard that uh, testifiers mentioned that rates for these uh, services have not increased in years and that the providers and the state face increased fuel costs, uh, a national driver shortage, which, which Tarek actually rightfully said that it's probably due to an ina inadequate wages, um, as well as increased maintenance, maintenance costs. Um, so what we're seeing now is that um, NEMT providers are either risking going out of business or not being able to uh, accept certain trips. And not having these services will result in um, higher costs for the state down the road because people will be forced to miss uh, preventative healthcare appointments and instead require emergency medical treatments, which of course uh, costs a lot more. So um, I want to say thank you to Senator Hoffman for uh, carrying this bill and you, Mr. Chair, for hearing it. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Senator Nelson. Oh, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I was just um, reviewing uh, the bill and I noticed on 5.5 up to 100% of IRS business deductions rate for volunteer transport. That's one of the things we passed last year. It's always nice to see that in law. <laughs> that is not new. That's existing law. That's good. But my question is this. Um, I Obviously, in, we all know the importance of uh, non-emergency medical transport. And we also know the cost of gasoline, $4 a gallon, uh, at least, is, is, uh, is crippling uh, to, to everyone. It's particularly crippling uh, to the non-medical uh, transport, I mean the medical non-emergency transport. My question is, is there a fiscal note, uh, Mr. Chair? I couldn't find it, and I'm reading in the uh, legislation here about the uh, increases uh, per mile, and also then the amendment that we passed, which has a, an additional uh, percent increase. I just, is there a fiscal note? I haven't, I didn't see it yet. No, that's because there's not one, and it would be a lot. So I oh. have no idea, <laughs> is it, it it would be considerable. Uh, rates are going up about, looks like 40% or something. So it's, or no more than that. Um, 238, about 60%, I think. So the the point of today is to, the, the gas prices have just gone up lately. These, I didn't know about the doubling of everything else. Pretty soon that turns into real money. Um, so we're presenting this as a, like a, hello. <laughs> Uh, and just to remind folks, uh, last year, the Senate has been really a good advocate for NEMT. Um, last year, there was a proposal to pretty much cut rates by about 60% or something using a broker, and which, would, yeah. which is some kind of Greek word for magician. We can drive further with, with less money. With less. If somebody takes a percentage off the top after you cut it in about half. Correct. Um, so we actually fought that through conference and simply refused. And uh, so kudos to everybody at this table and everybody in this body who thought that was a, not a good idea. We also attempted, uh, without success, to get some emergency money into this same bucket, which was um, to be polite, uh, declined uh, across the street. So uh, we have tried uh, putting our money where our mouths are, and now here we are again faced with even a more grave problem. Thank goodness we didn't do the magic broker last year. So, uh, Senator Benson. Um, Mr. Chair, I was just curious as to, are we laying this over? Is there a path to this bill? Consent calendar. It's being <laughs> Mr. Chair? It's being laid over. I, I might not be able to hang with you on that one. <laughs> might be some, no, this is being laid over, and uh, we that don't was, know. That was a motion, wasn't it, Mr. Chair? No. Oh, OK. <laughs> no. It was just emotion. I know. Um, other comments, and so we've been, uh, this committee, I think, faces the most challenging topics of any committee and our counterparts across the street uh, as we try to deal with these issues, which we've attempted to face head on. Uh, and these truly are life and death matters. Um, person misses dialysis, oh, sorry, you can go tomorrow. Uh, oh, they didn't come to the door because they're dead. Um, yep. And so 
Yep. And I was kind of, Senator Hoffman, and we've kind of joked about being the number one watch committee. And I wish we were the most boring committee, like discussing just technical changes to bills that are working great. Um, but people watch because they know we care on a bipartisan basis mm -hmm. and as we include every voice we can include here. And so I, I just think we're watching it all unwind. And I'm not sure if we're in life or death, but I think we're in purgatory. Um, yeah. And, uh, and I, I just appreciate the commitment of this committee to let us do all this work. Uh, Senator Murphy. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this is a this is a unending topic for us. Uh, how we assure uh, the adequate funding of non-emergency medical transport, and I appreciate that it is before the committee again. Uh, I appreciated the testimony from those who are doing the work. Uh, I hope that this committee uh, gets a target uh, so that we're able to do some work uh, to support. Um, and I also wanted to thank. Uh, Mr. Kramer, uh, for what you shared with us about the work that your drivers were doing as frontline workers uh, and the, the real efforts. I, I am I'm reluctant to use the word hero anymore because I feel like when we use that word, we, we, um, we don't mean it. Um, but I recognize the importance of what you and your organization and the drivers did for people at a time when Minnesota needed help. And I want to thank you for that. Very well said. Yeah. Senator Hoffman, last word, and then we'll uh, lay this over for now. No, Mr. Chair, I, 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 I want to echo what the, the good senator from St. Paul said. I hope, we get, I hope we get a target, Mr. Chair. I hope we do, because there are some real life and death things that we're dealing with due to what's happening outside the world. And, and um, I'm grateful that this committee actually has those conversations. And now, if we can just do something to, you know, have closure and, and, and perhaps fix the system. It's not an individual person's piece, right, Senator Abler? It's the system. And so uh, how can we support that? And I, I appreciate hearing these bills. And we're going to lay this one over to get moved on, correct? That's right. And I appreciate the testifiers. And so at least we accomplished getting it out there so that the other body can hear about it, and perhaps the governor can be aware. Um, I bet he watches this show, Senator Hoffman. I bet, I bet he's one of the many, many viewers who are, anyway, I'll stop. Well, I, you know, if the Arbitron rating system was still out, Mr. Chair, we'd see what our numbers really are, and then we could, you know, and say we could, that we, we could track back where it's on. Correct. Is it in the, never mind. So with, with that, the bill's laid over. We have to stop. Thank you. This is too serious. Um, thank you. Thank you. Anyway, Senate File 2845, and for members' information, uh, it's my desire that um, we can move this out today. Uh, Senator Murphy, with your previous advice that we came up with, uh, without a recommendation to pass, but that it be re-referred. And the intention is it would go to um, state government and then come back here where we can continue to work on it. So I know the commissioner is here, and Senator Eaton is here. Are you there, Senator Eaton? Um, Okay, so Commissioner, um, we have discussed this a couple of times, and uh, I'm happy you can be here again. Uh, and uh, so uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Well, just to summarize our previous testimony and a couple slides, if you will. Next slide. Uh, First of all, uh, the challenges with the separate uh, behavioral health agency, uh, just to summarize what we've said before, we'd like to finish our work of hardwiring our process improvement work in the behavioral health division inside DHS. The state of the art is in integrating care across behavioral health and physical health, not separating it. The behavioral health division as a separate agency would be tiny and have to add all kinds of functions to uh, be functional and that would be expensive. Uh, this would be one of the most complex potential splits of DHS with the federal requirement of a single Medicaid agency. And even then it would handle less than 20% of all behavioral health funding, most of which goes through our healthcare administration. Again, this would be the governor's 27th commissioner and is only DHS's fourth administration assistant commissioner. 
Next slide. What we would offer as an alternative is to hold a statewide summit this summer to level set on the state of the art and best practices to develop a roadmap for all the opioid settlement dollars coming into Minnesota and focus attention statewide post COVID on this epidemic. Passing the governor's budget proposals that invest over $100 million in this area and applying the entire capacity of the Department of Human Services over the next three years to moving Minnesota's mental health, substance use disorder, and opioid addiction services to whole new levels instead of working to create a new agency that would have to do the forming, norming, and storming we've done over the past three years. Last slide. Thank you very much. Well, and you're welcome. Um, and we have uh, Senator Eaton, did you want to say something? You're muted. There we oh, go. There you are. Perfect. <laughs> Sorry. Um, sure. Uh, thank you, uh, Senator Abler. And I appreciate the commissioner's comments. Um, my frustration has to do with the fact that we are, um, I am, uh, 11 years into working on these issues here in the um, Senate. And um, the only things I've seen happen are ones that we've passed bills on. I begged for um, a public service campaign to uh, notify the public of the public health crisis of opioid overdoses, to notify the public of Steve's law about the call for help, don't run, dial 911 to notify um, the public of uh, the issues of substance use disorder. I mean, it's um, when I started this, it was, uh, I think that we, were, we had about 300 deaths a year from opioids. Now we're over 1,000 a year. And um, still the number one problem is alcohol. So I just don't see our departments taking substance use disorder seriously. And after my 35 years plus in mental health, um, all I saw was we finally got the institutions pretty much closed down, got people out in the communities. Unfortunately, they've gone into the, um, the uh, into being incarcerated or uh, living under bridges or in homeless shelters. Uh, we don't have a whole lot of uh, mental health services that um, pick up the pieces where the uh, state hospitals used to uh, take care of people who were um, in crisis and those who were having trouble figuring out how to live in the community. There's, uh, you know, just like substance use disorder, you know, dealing with the acute phase is, is the kind of the easy part. The hard part is supporting recovery. And um, we don't do enough of that. And um, if you read any study or scientifically, it takes five to eight years for people to um, be not more at risk for uh, using drugs or alcohol than, they, than the regular non-addicted person. So we don't have those support systems in place. And uh, I'm... I keep waiting for the departments to do something um, other than what we legislate. Uh, the ORAC committee, the Opioid Epidemic Response Advisory Council, that was that was supposed to supplement what we were doing. That wasn't supposed to take the place of supplant. You know, I see the same path that the environment uh, water legacy went is happening with ORAC, and um, you know, the the standard funding of the. Uh, uh, you know, for naloxone or whatever is uh, really shouldn't be the responsibility of ORAC. That should that should fit into the um, the state's regular general fund budget. I, I, I ORAC should be for creating new ways to deal with because um, we're failing <laughs> with opioids. It's uh, it's still less than one in ten that get uh, treatment. It's still. Uh, you know, over a thousand people dying, overdosing, and now we have fentanyl. We're still treating the whole issue like it's still overprescribing from physicians, which has, for the most part, been resolved. 
um, even though they're still prescribing more than they did in the 90s. But um, it's, it's the synthetic opioids that are being put into everything. So whether someone's taking a, um, a pill that they think came from a pharmacy or, a, um, or cocaine or meth or whatever, um, they got fentanyl in them these days. And so it's, it's a death sentence. And I don't know, I'm pretty frustrated and I'm pretty um, overwhelmed by the whole situation. I don't think we're making progress. And, you know, I have a lot of experience. Uh, I'm a in person in recovery and I come from a long line of uh, people in my family in recovery. And, but I'm not an expert on substance abuse or mental health. I, I look for the experts to take charge and help us find some answers. I can only come up with um, bills that uh, come off the top of my head, uh, but doesn't come from any formal learning on the subject. I would, I would think that we have those people in our departments and that they could be coming forth with some programs or ideas that um, those of us in the legislature don't have to come up with. I'm done. Well, thank you very much. And that was just so heartfelt. I really appreciate it. Uh, Mr. Magnuson, you'd like to say a few words. Yes, um, thank you, Chair Abler and Senator Eaton, members of the committee. Uh, for the record, my name is John Magnuson, and I'm the Executive Director of March, the Minnesota Association of Resources for Recovery and Chemical Health. We are the statewide association of providers and professionals that uh, treat substance use disorder and the many co-occurring mental health issues. Issues that every family in Minnesota have and address. I'm here to also thank you for continuing to keep up the picture of Jake because it's the people that this is about. It's those members of our family who are not with us because of this devastating disease. It's those members that are dying in record numbers when we're using all of the evidence-based practice that we can find and we are still failing them. So March asks me to come here in support of the spirit and, t and intent of this legislation to lift up and address the growing crisis of the disease of addiction in Minnesota through the development and implementation of an inclusive and comprehensive response during this critical time. As you know, our state continues to be significantly impacted by untreated addiction, and the state's current fractured approach in responding <coughs> is not working. As providers, we see firsthand the devastating consequences this lack of focus brings to patients and their families. We struggle to have legislative changes implemented, and we thank you for those of you that are helping us. Funding prioritization is tough, and the silos that exist between agencies that create the bureaucratic roadblocks that prevent the government from being as effective as it could in serving our patients and our local communities, we can do better. In addition to the financial consequences of this inefficiency, the results for people are devastating. Drug overdose deaths are at record numbers. Deadly fentanyl is saturating our communities and Minnesotans continue to struggle with pandemic related mental health challenges. We support reform that ensures Minnesota has a singular elevated and coordinated approach across the substance use continuum of care to better serve the people in our state. This approach must include education, prevention, treatment, supportive services and recovery recovery from all pathways. It is beyond time for, Minnesotan, for Minnesota to have a plan that utilizes the full continuum of care that can be managed and implemented. Other states and the federal government have been working toward this and the people of Minnesota deserve no less. Mr. Chairman, those are my formal written remarks and if I may take a personal opportunity to say just a few words. Absolutely. I didn't know whether to come here as my name is John Magnuson, the head of March, or my name is John Magnuson and I'm an alcoholic, or a person in long-term recovery, or a person with substance use disorder, 
any of those are my pronouns, that I stand before you as somebody that is affected by this in a daily basis, saying that we have to do better. We can do better, but we have to elevate the issue. I don't believe that it is simply funding alone. And I disagree with the commissioner when something that might be complex and hard, we have to take on those challenges if we actually want to address this issue. Because the best evidence and science that we have right now that we're throwing at the issue has given us a doubling of the numbers that we're supposed to be affected by all of that. And Commissioner Malcolm sat in this seat and told you that next year expect even higher numbers. We've got to elevate this issue and I thank you for your time and I thank you for whatever approach we move forward because when I ask my good friend that I used to work for, Jim Ramstead, is it SUD or is it uh, mental health? He laughed at me. He said, Mags, those are the same issues that they were debating when I came in as a state senator that we debated all through the, my time in Congress and the answer is we have to elevate this issue. It's the stigma that kills people. And when we leave it hidden within an agency, not able to have the authority to take the actions that are needed because it never rises to the level of attention. That's what is the solution in my humble opinion. And last night, the last thing I'll say, Jake is why we're here. And last night I had the poor privilege of learning about Simon, where as I left a meeting, there was a gentleman who talked about his son, Simon. And the best with all the evidence that we have at the moment that I could give to him was my shoulder to cry on and say, because we're both in recovery, that there but for the grace of God go I. And yet that approach, I find sometimes in our evidence-based world, is under threat. The idea that I might gather together with others in fellowship and find a pathway to recovery because we believe so strongly in all pathways, yet sometimes the most simple we forget about. So thank you for the opportunity to speak from the heart. Thank you for the opportunity to speak upon uh, my members and we continue to look forward to the opportunity to work with you to solve this problem for all of Minnesotans. Thank you. One question. Thank you very much, Senator Murphy. Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, and thank you, uh, Mr. Magnuson. Um, it may be just today, but I, I don't think so. I am, am moved by your urgency. Uh, and I, I hope my colleagues, uh, elected colleagues with this responsibility, begin to feel moved by your urgency as well. Uh, we are elected and it is a privilege to serve and we have a responsibility to the people and I am um, I have I'm frankly been taken aback and uh, disappointed um, at what appears to be a behavior which is the status quo of you know it's the second year of the biennium and we don't have to pass a budget and we want to move to the election so let's just get done with our work at the expense of the needs of the people I appreciate you being honest with us about your status and for my cousin Liz who lost her life, and my cousin Joe who lost his life, and my beloved brother who lived and my nephew who's struggling. I want us to do better on the behalf of people. And uh, right now I don't know that we're poised to do that, but if you continue to push us and urge us, maybe we'll get there. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Nelson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Magnuson, thank you uh, for the testimony and and for sharing your experiences. And I guess my, my question is, we all know far too many loved ones, neighbors, constituents, who struggle with substance abuse or mental health. They, they travel together, uh, those, those, um, those illnesses. Now, my question is, if you had a wish list, no, no, I don't want a wish list. I want to know if you had a magic wand, can you tell me the three things that you think would be the most helpful to help people get 
one choose to get into treatment and recovery, and then second, what would that look like? What, what are the three things that you, with your magic wand, think would be the most helpful? Mr. Magnuson. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Senator. I didn't know that I was going to get a chance to have a magic wand today, but, um, um, you know, one of the things that, in my, again, humble opinion, um, you know, we're doing a lot of comparing this versus that. I always like to say I'm sure that liquid Drano is uh, safer or than liquid plumber. One of them has a higher level of safety. Not the, the reality is that neither of them are good for you. And so when we compare sometimes a substance that we want to bring to market, um, like marijuana, uh, and we compare that to other substances like alcohol and say that one is better, I don't care what the outcome of that debate is. What I know is that when we have more substances in the hand of people, that we're going to need more dollars for treatment because those are substances that people get addicted to. And when we have a blending of our pharmaceuticals that are then utilized as substances that people get high on and become addicted to, we're going to need more dollars for treatment. And when we have a lot of other issues that are facing us, we need more dollars for treatment. But dollars alone don't solve the problem because that's one of my wish list is more dollars for treatment. But we have to have a continuum that's built out. And we hear our friends in the mental health world talk a lot about that we need to build a system of care. And that's real. We need a continuum of care. And we need a continuum of care to support addiction because addiction is its own entity that can be treated. And a lot of times when you treat it effectively, you shake off a lot of the other mental health mm -hmm. co-occurring conditions. And so we save our system resources by addressing the right issue at the right time. And that's where doing the work on the preventive side would be helpful is the second issue and building that continuum. And the third would be truly honoring and respecting all pathways of recovery, mm -hmm. not just those that we think are our proven path, because as my example of one being better than the other, and so rather than looking at that kind of a comparison, we heard recently Dr. Kelly talk here that the average times that people are going to need to go through treatment is five. If we are less uh, interested in which one works better than the other, and we're more interested in what's the second treatment going to be for a person, and the third treatment, we might eliminate the fourth and fifth treatment. And therefore, what we're doing is we're utilizing the evidence and the science and the research that we brought forward by doing a better job of assessing um, what person needs what kind of treatment. And isn't that what a patient-centered approach to care is? So those are my three wishes, funding, um, you know, uh, better identifying and building the continuum, and then um, actually getting the person the care that that individual needs in a patient-centered way while closing no pathways to recovery. Thank you. Senator Nelson. Uh, uh, th thank you, Mr. Chair. Just, just a follow-up. Um, that is very insightful. And as you spoke about that, I, I thought about personalized medicine. We live in a world of personalized medicine where treatments are determined by particular characteristics. And what I heard you say here today is, um, personalized recovery, uh, personalized uh, to the, the, the need of the person, and not everybody's the same. And so um, I, I, I appreciate you uh, sharing that. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. And I'm not sure if I can make this work here, but uh, I just had an idea. Um, anyway, uh, so actually, just for the sake of the folks who are feeling like we're somehow picking on the department, I actually want to start blaming some governors. So Elmer Anderson gave us, can you see that? Uh, gave us some human services and then Carl Rolvog came along and then, uh, you know, uh, Rudy Perpich and Arnie Carlson and Jesse Ventura and Tim Pawlenty gave us our current monolithic human services department. And I helped. Every year we pass 
800 new pages of law here. And so, Commissioner Harpstead, good luck with making this all organized, and you've put your heart and soul into this place. All I'm saying is, can we <laughs> take out this little section here, and can we try another way? That's the idea of this bill, and there's no impugning of anybody. And uh, it would be a little more difficult than just taking it off of the pile, but that's really what we have. And we have an army of well-intended people here doing their work, and we see them every, every day when they come to us. Um, but I'm afraid if we don't do something different, it's not going to be different. And so that's my compulsion about this. And um, anyway, so thanks. Any other comments? Senator Rutke. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I don't have a whole lot uh, due to the fact that there's been a lot of good things already covered and said. Uh, but a couple of things I've heard refers to the, the authority and the responsibility um, that this new idea would develop. And, and that is great because we've, you know, we've seen the failures over the last great number of years. But you know, as I'm listening to all that, all I really wanted to add is at this point, nobody seems to be accountable. And to me, what you're driving for forward with this accountability. And in this circle, this uh, topic that we're talking about, um, it, it, we need to get serious and somebody has to be accountable about future plans and future successes. And you know, there's gonna be challenges, but at least it's not lost in that big pile of books that you just displayed. Thank you. Uh, Senator Wickland, and then we're, I'd like to vote if we can. I wanna talk about the other thing, but not to cut anybody off. Senator Wickland, go ahead. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I just wanted to comment. I, I definitely share the sense of urgency about doing um, doing something more and um, hope that that is what we accomplish this session. I remain uh, someone who is concerned about um, this particular bill, but not at all about the discussion about how how we can accomplish um, you know better things and make um, make progress in a more efficient manner. So I appreciate that you're going to have the bill come back here and I hope that we continue the discussion about, you know, what, what might be an appropriate way to, um, to try to strengthen what's done today and, and, and make it work better. So thank you. Well, that's, that's very well said. So, um, and so my intention, and I, I don't think the bill's perfect the way it's written. It's kind of nice. It, it's got some gaps I know of and, but starts with us trying to make a difference. No more assignments. Anyway, with that, uh, I'll move that Senate file, what the heck is it, um, 2845B, uh, ref we referred to the Committee on State Government Finance. Everybody understand the motion? Um, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, Senator Hoffman, and I really appreciate the discussion, and we, uh, I am absolutely open to ideas, but I just, can't take it with any more of these pictures. Uh, Senator Hoffman, Mr. You Chair, the matter to our attention. I did, Mr. Chair, and, and uh, I'm I'm wondering, as you, um, I mean, there's there's a there's a couple of things that we have talked about uh, regarding the the system, and and again, this is not an individual. I, I like the the narrative you gave when you lift, listed all the the governors, you know, of because every time somebody comes into place, we we have new laws get added, right? And I remember a certain researcher referring to it as a kitchen cabinet right and you know every time you get something new there's a there's a new can of soup that gets added and nobody even aligns the soups with the beans or whatever and, and I think if there's one thing we can do in this committee would be to uh, align the beans up and so uh, but it still leaves a lot of questions and, and this ha was disturbing to me uh, Senator Abler on the fact that the parents are 73 years old and we were told by the system, we have a plan. And, and we even said, you know, the plan, it, it scared me, Jim, uh, uh, almost a month ago to hear about, well, the plan is to waive some licensing requirement and let them go to an assisted living facility. It's still an institution, right? And so I, I would like to get some conversation and, and some, you know, construct around the fact that not only do I see this as a sad 
event in, in Minnesota for somebody that we should be helping take care of. But at the same time, you know, what is it options wise and, and, um, and hopefully there's some people that forget more in a day than I do regarding Olmstead or 245D or whatever. And so with that, Mr. Chair, I thank you for the conversation earlier and, and I hope we can hear from some people. Thanks, and I see Ms. Mertz there, and just to be, do you wanna go first or do you want us to talk to the, Mr. Rosenfeld and Ms. Holden first? Ms. Mertz, what do you prefer? Hello there. Hi, Senator Abler, members of the committee. My name is Natasha Mers. I'm with the Department of Human Services, the Disability Services Division for the record. Um, Senator Abler, to your question, I would certainly defer to you, Mr. Chair, about the, the order in which you want to take uh, testimony or have questions. Okay, well then, uh, I guess that means we're gonna, so let's just, I appreciate you being here and I think we're gonna have a discussion for a little while. We got 15 minutes or so, which is just a good start at least. Mr. Rosenfeld, um, we uh, published some comments that I didn't ask you, but we did it. Um, so, uh, but I figured your stuff is public anyway, but uh, and I know we have purposely kept the identity of this uh, family confidential and I know you would do the same thing, but uh, to the issues at hand, can you please talk to what it means to give up a waiver, what rights a person has for due notice, um, and that topic, and then, uh, so make your comments, we'll hear from Ms. Holden, we'll hear from Ms. Mertz, we'll hear from you again, so uh, welcome to the committee. Thank you, Chair Abler and members of the committee. Can you hear me okay and see Perfect. me? Perfect, yeah. my technology working? Yeah. Uh, well, uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to address you today. Um, I am Bud Rosenfield. I'm the Ombudsman for Mental Health and Developmental Disabilities. I think most of you are aware of, the, of our agency and the variety and scope of the work we do, but just for a little bit of background, our overarching statutorily created mission, as you know, is to promote the highest attainable standards of treatment, competence, efficiency, and justice for people receiving services for mental health, developmental disabilities, chemical dependency or emotional disturbance. And one way we do that work is through our regional ombudsman. Um, I'm fortunate to have a relatively small but very experienced, skilled professional staff uh, officed across the state and who, among other duties, field client calls on a daily basis and provide anything from simple assistance like information referral to investigations, informal mediations, other forms of advocacy. Over the past six months or so, as you might expect, we've been fielding an increased number of calls related to the workforce shortage, uh, an issue I know that this committee has spent time today and, and over the last few months um, addressing. Most of those calls involve some kind of uh, service termination or closure, temporary or permanent closure of facilities and programs. Um, these problems aren't limited to a specific area of the state. They're not limited to a specific provider or provider type. And of course, the workforce shortage uh, overall and people's lack of access to needed care uh, is not limited even to licensed facilities, but includes people receiving services in their own homes, and it goes beyond residential services to day programs and other types of services and supports. There's been, a, I think it's fair to say, an adverse impact on clients receiving services across our disability and social service systems and programs. I know this committee has been presented uh, with these problems and with a number of possible solutions and is supporting many ideas that try to address these problems. It, it's, there's been a focus on funding, uh, the ability to pay higher wages, or pension bonuses. Of course, that's important, especially for home and community-based service waiver programs because I'm not sure that we focus enough on this and we all understand it, but they're public programs. Collectively, we need to make sure that the waiver services we authorize for people are actually available, that they have a chance of getting them and finding staff who are competent to provide those services. Um, and that the ultimately the programs and the system we create is are competitive with the rest of the economy. Private companies can charge more for their products if they need to, to then pay their employees more. Even in other parts of the care system, private hospitals or nursing homes can sometimes increase prices in certain ways, but direct care waiver service providers can't. They don't have that kind of option. It's not how the waivers work. So we have an obligation to, to review whether our programs are working, if not to take some action. And I appreciate your assistance and your willingness to look at those options. As I think we all realize, funding isn't the only critical piece of the problem that, that has been discussed uh, recently. Second challenge is rethinking how people get access to the services and staffing that they need and developing greater flexibility within the services and programs. So uh, you know, temporary staffing pools are one example. But again, 
The challenge here is to make sure that we're not just targeting settings or a specific kind of provider, but rather the care that people need regardless of setting. So we need to make assistance like that available as broadly as possible and create more opportunities for people to choose and receive services and budgets they need to choose to live in alternative settings if, if that's the way they go. Um, if we only look at supporting specific provider type or say licensed or provider owned settings and not services provided in people's own homes, for example, then we disadvantage one group of clients uh, and we inadvertently create more pressure on those licensed settings that are already struggling to meet clients needs. And all of that also undermines then many of the basic principles that we cite as foundational to our service systems, individualized services, uh, person centered planning, informed choice integration and inclusion under Olmstead. Um, and that brings me to the third piece of the problem, the, the part that I think was raised by the email that Senator Hoffman referred to earlier, client rights and protections. There are gaps currently in how we embed these principles and expectations in client rights and protections, both the difference between what our programs say is required and what's actually enforced, as well as the significant disparities in client rights that exist depending on which service system you're actually in. On that former piece, and as illustrated by the case Senator Hoffman uh, brought up, as well as many other cases that our office works on on a daily basis, we have various pre-service termination requirements in place. For example, if, if you wanna terminate waiver services, you have to provide advance notice of that termination, 60 days for residential waiver services. And that's to give people a chance to consider possible mitigation options. Maybe you can avoid it if you do something differently um, or at least give them time to find alternative services. Some providers are not sending that notice. Some providers are sending notice, but it's, it's giving people a few days. That's clearly not adequate. It's not compliant, but it's also not being enforced. So it, while it's on the books and it's a requirement that we thought carefully about, if you don't enforce it, it's not really a requirement and it's not protective for individuals. Similarly, there are requirements that providers Consult with service teams. Every time a person goes on the waiver, you have a service team that helps support that person and come up with a service plan. Uh, or to seek assistance from case managers before they even send a notice of service termination. And in too many cases, these requirements are not being followed and they're not being enforced. And again, they're on the books, uh, but if they're not enforced, then the person who gets harmed by, by the fact that they're not being followed or enforced uh, and that there's, there's non-compliance uh, you know, is the client. That's problematic. On the second piece related to client rights and, and uh, protections, it has become clear at this point that even more needs to be done um, in terms of the requirements that we impose on waiver service providers. There is proposed legislation, for example, to give in-home waiver service recipients the right to appeal and to request a, a stay of proposed service terminations. That doesn't currently exist. That would certainly help. It would be more protective of people and their rights. But in reality, we have a fundamentally weak expectation of what waiver service providers must do before they terminate services. And as by way of comparison, the assisted living licensure legislation that you all passed just a couple of years ago made it clear that providers can't close or otherwise terminate services without assisting in actually finding a safe alternative placement for each affected client. That makes sense, that, that promotes continuity of care. That same requirement does not exist for people who receive waiver services. Their services can ultimately be terminated even if no alternative placement has been found. And this leads to people ending up in emergency rooms or in crisis placements unnecessarily. It's, it's not in those circumstances, the clients who are actually in crisis, it's the system and the providers who are in crisis. But we're allowing the system to place the clients into crisis. Thank you. And the question ultimately is, shouldn't we expect, expect more? Aren't people on the waivers entitled to the same kind of basic protection and continuity of care that we offer to and expect in other settings like assisted, uh, assisted livings. The, the current system is obviously not person-centered. It doesn't assure informed choice. It can lead to situations like that described by Senator Hoffman with unnecessary institutionalization. If we're truly committed to protecting the rights and welfare of waiver recipients, then this problem needs to be addressed. And I'm, I'm happy to take more questions Thank or you. discuss specifics with you. I appreciate you allowing me to add these comments and for taking the time today to, to address these concerns. No, and I do appreciate the broad approach. Um, for today, I'm particularly interested in current law and uh, what is and is not being done. And so maybe Ms. Holden can 
comment about that. I um, this and this and Ms. Mertz you, will be talking to you about. Uh, if, is a 60-day notice really something you're supposed to enforce or not? And is this service meeting supposed to happen or not? And um, so I'm gonna. And so Ms. Holden, do you want to comment? Can you focus? Uh, we just have 10 minutes left or so, but can you focus on current law and what you think about this particular situation as much as you get to know? And you can be theoretical about it as well if you have to be. Welcome. Sure. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Chair Abler. Um, can you hear me okay? Perfect. Great. Um, and thank you to for you taking the time um, to address this important, just pressing subject. My name is Martin Holden. I'm with Legal Aid, which includes the Minnesota Disability Law Center. And yeah, yes, the, the issue of what is currently required and what is actually happening is, is a huge one when it comes to what we what we've all put into, you know, what we've put into our statutes is intended to be protections for people who are in these situations, whether there's a crisis or not. So things like 60 day notice, um, you all, and we were really grateful for this past, a lot of language around form choice last session. And as you can imagine, the, the dire circumstances of the workforce shortage are really putting a lot of pressure on, on those protections. And, and that makes sense. And yet, it's our view at DLC that those protections are actually more important now than ever, because this is how we make sure that, that people continue to find places that work for them and that, and that are safe, and that we don't shift our system in this moment of crisis into one that is more expensive and less, um, and less inclusive for people. So for example, the person, I, I'm, I'm not gonna comment on specific situations, you know, we all know we represent clients, but the example in the materials for today is not, is, not even remotely the only example of people needing to move, whether it's from an own home setting to a group home because of lack of staff or from a, a group home setting to an ICF. The, it's looking right now like a one-way ratchet towards more institutionalization and more, more expensive settings. And what we really think could be helpful is relying on the protections that we have already put into statutes that are intended to support. If there were actually 60 days notice happening, maybe we can have more conversations in those individual cases about what are the true options available for people. Maybe, you know, maybe sometimes if you're in a family where the parents are 70 years old, maybe there's a niece who just moved into her own apartment, hasn't found a roommate yet, you know, has a, has a friend who could do in-home support. Meanwhile, the, you know, what we spend on, on group home settings, which is really important for people who want that as their, their place to live and for who need that level of support, is the 24-hour staffing. But it's because of the workforce shortage, that's simply not what's available right now in a lot of those settings. And so if, if there are ways for families to more flexibly find other options, we really would like to see more flexibility on the family and individual side about how they can creatively come up with their own solutions. Because for it, right now, and this is, maybe this, this is not about what we currently do, it's something that we could do, is, is give folks the budget that they're getting for their group home settings for more consumer directed options if they have informal supports that could meet their needs because there, the other piece of this that i that i do want to emphasize mr chair is just just these services that folks are using and need are so critical i mean it's it's literally everyday things getting out of bed using the bathroom eating these are things that people absolutely need to support to do every single day and what we aim to do as a system is give them the choice about where they receive those supports and how they receive those supports. And that is what's falling apart. And so we would really like to see more attention to using the protections that are already in place and more creativity and flexibility about giving people true options when the current situation is no longer tenable. Thank you. I have a, um, so let me uh, just go ahead. Um, so it would just just to clarify there there is an absolute 60-day notice that a person has to give to terminate services in a group home or in a home setting is that true or is that typically a, yes and well no is that is that are they required, required are they supposed to be giving 60 days notice and is that some law that people are supposed to follow do you know that that's my understanding all right. Yes, Mr. Chair. And this service meeting before you terminate yeah. services, that's supposed to happen even before the 60 days when things are getting problematic. Is, do you know about that? Well, maybe you can, if, if you're uncertain, we just want people to follow the law at least as far as they can, and it's, it's the department's responsibility to, to enforce that. So 
you know, this is, we'll discuss this some more. So Ms. Mertz, do you want to offer your thoughts? Can you tell me about 60 days and meetings prior to terminations and all that? And I figured you must know. So welcome to the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. So um, I am not an expert in licensing, but I can share what I understand from the policy perspective the licensing requirements to be. Um, for termination of, in, of services that are characterized as intensive under 245D, which uh, would include residential services that are you know, delivered in community residential settings, there is, yes, a 60-day notice requirement that needs to be delivered to the person and their uh, legal guardian if they have one ahead of the termination. Uh, with that notice, it, in, included in that notice is contact information for, the, for Mr. Rosenfield's office as well as the long-term care ombudsman's office, as well as notices of the right to appeal that termination. Um, so I'll pause there and see what other questions you have. And. Um well, it just seems most cases I've heard of don't have 60 days notice, and um, at least a bunch of them haven't. And so if they don't give 60 days notice, uh, what happens? Do you, do you tell them they need to give 60 days notice, otherwise they're going to lose their license, or do you do anything about enforcing that? So, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, failure to, to comply with regulations under 245D could potentially result in some type of a licensing action, but I would need to defer to my colleagues there to determine kind of how they triage and look at those things. I really don't want to uh, speak out of turn in that regard. I would also add that the um, mandatory contact information for the offices of ombudsmen is another consumer protection that's available, as well as the right to appeal. So there are multiple strategies. Some are regulatory in nature and some are consumer rights oriented um, within the current requirements. Well, thanks. If you could do some homework between, um, well, all three of you, if you could write down what you think the law says people have to do and let us know. Um, and so, Ms. Mertz, I'm glad you came today. Um, and, I, and we're just kind of running low on time here, but this is, if it's a 60-day rule that you can't terminate services, or if it, I said that bad syntax, but if it, you have to have 60 days notice to terminate and people aren't, then somebody at your office is the enforcing person. And this young lady here has been, in, in the words of uh, Mr. Um, <laughs> Rosenfeld, I want to call him Bud, um, that there's a failure to do something here. Senator Hoffman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I think what you wanted to get to is there's the explicit and mandatory licensing and client rights statutory provisions that are under Chapter 245D. That's where the, the, the failure to, to, to do that, right? It failed to require the provider to comply with those explicit and mandatory rights. And also, Mr. Chair, that the um, the other thing that came out of the conversation right now is I'm confused at how many different systems are involved in the care of an individual. And, and I mean, to tracking, no, that's a licensing issue or that's this issue or who's holding the person accountable, right? We're the ones who set the system up, right? And it's like, we need to now help clarify what that system looks like. But the things I just said to you is what the uh, the issue of uh, the issue of on the mandatory licensing on the compliance and the explicit and client rights under 245D. And I see you got Phil. Kristen Hoffman, you know, in my life, if I've needed to know something, I just ask Phil. So, Mr. Griffin, uh, <laughs> just and I shouldn't Phil. be facetious. This is like just gravely serious, so I'm sorry for the light yeah. moment. But, Mr. Griffin, what do you know about Mr. This? Chairman, members of the committee, Phil Griffin representing ARM uh, today. And uh, I just have to say that um, my client is very concerned about the, the tone of what we're discussing here today. Uh, we believe that we are complying uh, with state law and intend to comply with state law. Uh, so uh, the fact that it's being implied that we're not giving notice, I, I hope, uh, I can't promise that every single case we have complied with the law, but that certainly is our intent, and we're happy to work with the committee. Um, you've had numerous hearings, as you pointed out at the very beginning of this discussion today, at the beginning of the hearing, uh, that this workforce crisis is impacting our membership and the people that we serve 
in ways that we've never contemplated, and we don't have answers for that, and that's why these closings are occurring. Um, but we are trying to work with families, and there are people who have jobs uh, that are supposed to help with moving people into new situations when we are forced to close these operations, and right. I hope those people are fulfilling their obligations as well. Senator Hoffman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Now, let me make it very clear. This is not a tone toward an individual or an individual company. It just so happens the individual we're talking about in need happened to stay at that individual company. This is a systems issue. It completely is a systems issue. And Mr. Griffith saying the tone of your, your conversation, I think, is completely irrelevant to the fact that we have a broken system, Jim. That's what we've been talking about for months. The yeah. system is broke. And, and it's evident to me that, it. and again, I, I look at your stack of of books, you know, we'll go back and blame Governor Perpich or whatever. I mean, the, the fact is, we've had multiple times to do it. This is the year that we should be able to help fix the system and align those dang beans up in the in the in the kitchen cupboards, Senator Abler. But this is not a direct um, personalization to your client, Mr. Griffith. I just want to make you very clear on that. So the tone of this is about the the, the frustration of the system. These are the kinds of anecdotal incidents that really absolutely keep me awake at night wondering if somebody's going to actually live through the evening and, and where are the supports when we set the system up. So Mr. Abel, I just wanted yeah. to make that very clear. No, I appreciate it. And we could have redacted maybe a couple more words on this. We just didn't want to include the woman uh, and the family. But um, And just, well, just to go back to the client thing, there has been no committee in the legislature or, or a group of people more interested in helping the providers to continue to provide. We have done everything we can do. Um, we have three times the governor on money we're trying to get out the door. We've given just so much support. So we're in this together. But my concern, and so I don't know what the rule is, but I know a bunch of people have told us they didn't get 60 days notice. And if there's a 60 day notice rule, your providers have to do it and the department has to enforce it. And so at the end of the day, it's all about the young lady who was, I saw her picture, she's just a, just a, <laughs> nobody asked for this. No one did anything, the, your, the, the providers didn't really do anything wrong, they just tried to keep serving and then all the world ended. This family didn't do anything wrong, the girl didn't do anything wrong, but somebody has to make it work. And with all respect, you know, all hands on deck, we were told a while ago. And yeah, and there's a plan and the disability hub wasn't even, people didn't know about it. And so that's our motivation. So I will apologize to whoever feels like we're ripping on them. Um, but who's gonna worry about this family? And the, they're 73 years old. And this particular person needs a Hoyer lift 15 times a day. Where do you put one of those into your bathroom? That's the problem. And what do we do? And that's what woke me up this morning at five in the morning. And I'm no special person. I don't, that's not anything bad about any, like, and I'm no hero, but help us. We are here to work together. And thank you for your candor. Uh, Ms. Mertz, we're out of time. Uh, to Mr. Rosenfeld and Ms. Halden. Um, Mr. Chairman, we're here to work with you as well. That's the goal of our providers and why they are in business. Absolutely, absolutely. So, um, but I think we need to explore this 60 day thing and I think we mean it if that's the rule. So we gotta leave it at that. Uh, anyway, we got a lot of work on Thursday and we're just doing our best. So thank God you, Mr. Bless Chairman, members. Thank you everybody, we're adjourned. <laughs>